thank you very much. It's uh, a, a first for me to be talking um, to a webinar group uh, via mobile phone, um, but that's the troubleshooting that we've gone to tonight. Uh, tonight's session is A Spoonful of Sugar, Teaching Rational Prescribing to GP Registrars. And uh, you will have been expecting Dr. Simon Morgan, somebody who's very well known to the GP training community. Those of you uh, who know him would have been uh, looking forward to seeing his face. In fact, you won't be seeing any, anybody's face tonight. But you will be hearing from Dr. Justin Coleman, who is stepping in for Simon Morgan. So thanks very much for joining us. Now, as you'll see tonight, we have uh, 42 of you here, and uh, we purposefully have everybody muted, including ourselves, for the first part of tonight, and just wanted to make sure that um, you were aware that you can still ask questions throughout the session. Just simply put them into uh, the chat box down the bottom left. We can obviously see those and we'll uh, let Justin know what they are and uh, ask answer them as we go through this session. Now we always make sure that we uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this meeting is taking place and pay our respects to the elders past and present and their families and uh, for those of you that are joining from all around Australia, fantastic to have you here and uh, please do ask as many questions as you would like, we will try and get to them. If we don't, we'll certainly uh, get back to you with the frequently asked questions and make sure that those are answered there. Now the webinar housekeeping, not to labour the point, but you are muted, there, uh, it would be difficult to run a webinar like this with background noise. I, I've explained how to ask a question and we are recording this webinar for those who um, were dissuaded or were not able to join tonight. So thanks very much for being here and without further ado, I will hand over to Justin Coleman. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Glenn, and uh, I apologise for disappointing uh, 40 plus people that I'm not Simon Morgan. Um, I consider myself the new Simon Morgan, or he perhaps is the old Justin Coleman, one of the two. I have actually got enough, uh, I can see the screen now as we flick around, so I hopefully we'll be able to control the slides, but we'd better get stuck in straight away. So basically this is how to teach our registrars um, how to prescribe rationally. So um, the concept behind it is that um, it's, it's a very important part of our practice and uh, we all should be uh, comfortable at it and um, it's sometimes surprisingly difficult. But I thought we'd start with this little case. Um, so Glenn, confirm for me, you can see Bailey up on the screen there. Okay, indeed. Excellent, so Bailey's a three-year-old fella, presents with his mum. Sonia, 36 hours of runny nose, fevers and grizzliness, something we see most days. Going on a ski holiday in three days, he's just got to be better within three days. And he's had otitis media in the past and a tongue tie repair, um, which is a red herring, as it's known in the RACGP exams. Uh, and on examination, he has a low-grade fever and he looks pretty well. And you look in his ear and the right tympanic membrane is uh, red um, and not bulging and he's got a red throat and multiple cervical nodes. So fairly typical presentation which I will let you mull over for the moment because we'll move straight on. Uh, learning objectives which I always consider the most boring slide of any slide set but uh, apparently meant to do them. But um, the uh, what we'll discuss is the influences on uh, how our registrars are taught to prescribe the challenges for them to prescribe in a quality fashion and the um, strategies for teaching them how to prescribe and uh, we'll look at some common scenarios, polypharmacy and the concept of de-prescribing which is sort of a word invented I think in the last uh, four or five years um, but it's actually a very important word and, and de-prescribing just to flag it is sort of the uh, when you sit down with a bit of logic and a bit of knowledge and you go through, uh, deliberately go through um, everyone's lists of medications before writing repeats for them. So it's already been prescribed and your decision currently is whether to double click on that screen and write repeats. It's particularly important in older people and, and, and people on multiple medications. And we'll look at some resources for prescribing. And we have Paracelsus. Um, 
the many of us said of alchemy that's for the making of gold and silver. For me, such is not the aim, but to consider only what virtue and power may lie in medicine. So he's trying to make gold out of medicine. Funnily enough, gold is a medicine or was. You know, I don't know if they use it anymore for arthritis. There are people who know more than that about that than I will. Let's look at prescribing in Australia. So. Um, uh, Medicine is where it's all at. It's sort of what we do, and uh, almost sometimes I think what defines us as a as a doctor. Uh, and we prescribed 214 million prescriptions in that year, worth nine billion dollars. So it's a lot of stuff. The top ten by volume and cost. So this is what prescri prescribed. So 2014 is the last, um, you know, the recent one. We have lots of data on, um, and. We have the top 10 by count is a, so you've got your statin, your PPI, another statin, another PPI, some paracetamol, a, uh, what's that, an ACE inhibitor, metformin of course, good old uh, drug, uh, and a puffer, and a couple of puffers there. All right, so basically antihypertensive statins, so those, those chronic disease sort of uh, medications, asthma, and cardiovascular disease plus paracetamol thrown in. And if you look at uh, by look at it by cost, um, it's some of the stuff. Well, the first one I've never prescribed in my life, but it's just uh, incredibly expensive. That's why it costs so much. One of the MABs. Um, and then the statins are so. Is that Crestor? I think Reserva statin. Brilliant marketing campaign. That's why we all prescribe so much uh, rosuvastatin, I suspect. But um, anyway, that's the cynic in me coming out. So that's uh, that, that costs a lot of money. And um, then yeah, a couple of MABs. You know, I'm not going to try to pronounce them. I won't pretend that I've prescribed them. And and then the uh, combination puffers. Another thing which really we tend to jump incredibly quickly into combination puffers, even though if you read all the guidelines it, it says not to. Uh, it says sort of start with one and then add the second if you need, and then as soon as you can get rid of the second, take it down again. But there's so many people who love their, their same puffer and they just wander in saying, oh, it's okay, I'll, I'll just keep on that. And sometimes I think we don't give them a trial of winding it back. And of course the PPI and some insulin in there as well. Um, the point about prescribing is it is our power as a doctor. It's, I mean, without it, you know, we'd be pretty much stuffed for a lot of uh, diseases we see. But it's also our peril. So we, we're sort of given this key of power and it can cause a lot of harm, which is why, you know, quite rightly we learn so much about it and think so much about it. Um, there's a, one and a half million Australians out of the 24 million or whatever of us there are suffer an adverse event from medicines each year. That, of course, most of those are relatively minor. Uh, some of them cause hospital uh, admissions, some of them cause death. Uh, it causes 400,000 visits to GPs, uh, 140,000 hospital admissions. These are adverse effects from um, prescribing. Uh, lots and lots and lots of money and uh, then AMR, I think, stands for antimicrobial resistance or as we know, antibiotic resistance, um, which is a problem as well. Um, if you look at um, hospital admissions done, so the, this is this graph here is a um, look at studies which have gone into you know into detail as to the cause of hospital admissions. Uh, the colours are basically each line is a different study in a different year, but the the purple colours are uh, labelled geriatric, so the population studied by those one, two, three, four, five studies was the older population and clearly for them there's a very substantial proportion of older people's uh, hospital admissions are caused by prescribing misadventure. Um, now that, that includes things like actual errors or you know either prescription errors or dispensing er errors, but I don't think that, this, that really is a huge proportion of them, it's, it's really just um, you know, side effects and, and problems with the medication, I think. So it doesn't, this doesn't discriminate between the cause of the um, adverse effect, but just saying it was an adverse effect. For other people, you know, paediatrics, it's much, much lower, but the emergency department um, and medical wards are sort of you know, um, about where it's at. I think you know, it sits at around about 5% um, overall. 
Uh, that's just to remind us, yeah, that we, um, you know, when we wield a, a sword, uh, we can do a bit of damage if we don't wield it well. Uh, the prescribing cascade, I did want to touch on this because I think it's something we're familiar with and I think uh, registrars, it, it takes a long time for a, a doctor coming out of a hospital to be aware of the prescribing cascade. I think the reason being that when people are in hospital, and this is where they're taught, um, you know, you're taught, okay, this is a symptom, quickly come to a, a conclusion, this is the likely diagnosis, and start a medication. And, and that really is about it for the prescriber in hospital. I mean, at some point they might stop something, like, but or even then they usually send them out. If they start an antibiotic, they're usually still on it when they leave and all that sort of thing. So, so there's this huge emphasis on um, problem X, once you've ticked the box, you know, it's sort of a, a doctor house sort of thing, like that huge question is in the discovering the diagnosis and then it's just a matter of simply, oh well you slot the, uh, the jigsaw piece in and you prescribe. Of course we know in our general practice, you know, life is not so neat and uh, people are on chronic medications and their, uh, you know, symptoms come and go and, and severities come and go and, and uh, cardiovascular risk, you know, increases and then you get to a point where in fact you're in a nursing home and it, your cardiovascular risk probably doesn't matter necessarily as much as it used to when you were independent and all of a sudden things like quality of life and, and not fainting and not feeling nauseous um, might matter a lot more. So, so, you know, throughout one's lifespan there's this ever-changing um, uh, reasons for prescribing or for not prescribing and I think you know as GPs well to me we own that space because we are I mean we you know someone has a heart attack or a stent or something and we quite rightly send them to the expert the cardiologist they do stuff to them start them on stuff and say you know away you go and you're on to a statin and a zetamib and, and the GP can measure your cholesterol and that, that's it and, and they don't go back there and there's no real reason they should but you know they've also meanwhile been to the endocrine and four other specialists in the orthopod for their intractable knee pain and all that sort of stuff. And we're the ones left sort of with the, the, total, <clears throat> the total picture and, and they're on lots of medications. And you know, six months later, it's up to us to double click on each of those medications or our registrars and sort of decide again afresh do they need, are they going to be better off on this medication tomorrow than not on the medication? And what may have been a, an expert decision, you know, three years ago when they had a heart attack, well things may have changed, priorities may have changed and I think it's, um, you, you're not really ever going to get a specialist except with the exception I guess of, uh, you know, it's a general physician and that sort of thing, I think they still exist. I haven't met one in a long time. Uh, in the country, they certainly exist. Um, you know, so but really, for most people, it's the it's the GP who has that role. Uh, so the cascade is this is just an example. You start an ACE inhibitor, you get an adverse reaction, and the person comes in and sees a registrar the next time and says, "Look, I'm feeling um, dizzy," and the registrar says, "Oh, hang on, there's got to be um, a, a, a tablet for dizziness. Oh, here it is. It's in Mims. It's plo." Perazine, and so they start uh, the stematol and um, they start that and then they get a reaction to that, they start getting uh, a fall and, and a hip fracture and then they're on, they're on something else. So there, there's, um, when I do this as a workshop occasionally, sort of GPs put up their hands left, right and centre and say yes this leads to this and you know whether it's uh, fluid overload and adding in or whatever, I'm sure you can all think of many examples. The beauty of a one-way webinar is I don't have to listen to them. No, that's not it. Is uh, unfortunately you don't get the chance to uh, feedback to me your brilliant prescribing cascades. But they are certainly something to teach the registrar because as I say they're coming from this algorithm where if you have a symptom what you do is you add a medication. And we have to relearn, reteach those algorithms and particularly again looking at the older population, polypharmacy, I think 10% of people over the age of 65 in Australia are on 10 drugs or more. 10% on 10 or more medications, including uh, puffers, which is a huge amount. And really, you know, who's to say that it, it, it turns from sort of hard science to sort of our guesswork as to whether drug number 11 is really going to make them feel all that much better. If they're feeling depressed, and drug number 11 is a SSRI, is that really all that much more likely to help their depression 
than perhaps stopping something going down, you know, down to nine drugs or eight drugs. And in fact, when you do studies in nursing homes, and there was a great one done by um, some GPs last year in Sydney, and go in and actively take people off some of these things, um, in fact, they do better, and not only do better, actually live longer. People live longer on fewer drugs uh, for some strange reason, even though individually, you know, each drug is designed, each of the chronic disease drugs is designed to uh, usually to make you live longer. But if you add enough into the chemical soup of our blood, um, they seem to have these interactions and effects which are very hard to to individualise and going in and stopping some of these things uh, really can help people. All right, um, I, I don't know if there's sort of, uh, if anyone sort of protests against anything I'm saying, feel free. Um, I sort of have the power and the microphone, so there's little you can do about it, but you can type in a little, um, little comment there. So this is just looking at what factors influence behaviour. The reason I show you this and we go through these is these are the things which we should be telling, teaching our registrars. And I think one good tutor to do with the registrar after you've, you know, you've done your diabetes tutor and your hypertension tutor and your contraceptive tutor, maybe throw in a tutor about, about these five things and see if the registrar can come up with the concepts of what factors influence our prescribing behaviour. And the chances are that we as supervisors really will know this stuff. Sometimes the registrars, you know, well, certainly mine, I only ever get smart ones, and they seem to know more things than me once they look up their uh, smartphones, which I think is cheating. Um, but, you know, about this big picture stuff, we as supervisors really do know more uh, because this stuff comes with wisdom, the, the age of wisdom. I have grey hairs. So these are some examples. And again, these, you know, these are from the literature and also from, from workshops we run. So with the doctor, what affects who prescribes what? It's clinical knowledge and experience. We've just talked about that. Confidence and risk aversion. And in fact, there's a, I wrote an article just this morning um, in uh, Medical Observer, but um, talking about this great study uh, done in the BMJ earlier this year. I think they had 45 million patient years. So it was absolutely enormous study. And rather than going through individual outcomes, they, they were just looking at antibiotics and they decided to look at the lowest quartile, so the, the GPs who prescribe uh, on the NHS the fewest number of antibiotics per patient versus the highest uh, so the top quartile, and the suggestion was that the top ones would have fewer um, infective complications, You're looking at meningitis, encephalitis, mastoiditis, uh, quinsy, all those sorts of things. And to cut a long story short, um, there was no difference. So in other words, GPs who prescribe judiciously with their antibiotics think about it and tend to prescribe low presumably must be picking among the people they prescribe for all those people who are likely to get uh, infective complications or they have systems in place and they encourage the patient to come back or whatever it is. What it, we don't know the specific features of those GPs, but the point is that their rates of complications are no higher than the top Quartile. And of course, there's huge differences in cost and adverse effects and, and you know, the health system costs and antimicrobial resistance costs and all those sorts of things. But, but of course, one of the big, the big excuses, if you like, or, or I suppose it's a harsh word, but the big reasons why high prescribers of antibiotics get very annoyed at uh, people like me is because they say, well, you've never seen a mastoiditis and I saw one in 19... 92 and it was awful, well, you can now come back and say actually that your number of mastoiditis you'll see in your lifetime as a GP will be the same whether you're a high prescriber or a low prescriber. Um, moving on past doctors to the patient, obviously the patients have a lot of uh, impact on what we prescribe. Uh, the ability to pay is certainly one. Um, I work in Aboriginal health and that was a huge issue before the uh, close the gap uh, provisions, provisions came in. Uh, compliance, so adherence, um, whether they actually take them once they prescribe them. And of course, re request and expectations. So there's lots of work being done, uh, but it's always slower than working through doctors. Um, in, in the public domain, trying to talk about antibiotics specifically, but not so much about any other medications. 
Uh, and in the end, I suspect the best people to educate the public are us GPs, because we see whatever it is, 80 something percent of them every single year. And you know, most people come in for these things. So certainly, probably the, the longest we've been um, altering expectations of patients has been with <coughs> pardon me, viral colds and things, but there's lots of other things as well. And certainly those of us who, in fact, those of you, because I don't do a lot of it, who are sort of do a lot of palliative care, nursing homes, geriatrics, that sort of thing, are very au fait with this sort of thing, you know, sort of um, altering patient expectations and family expectations as someone gets older in terms of, you know, a pill for every ill. Um, the, then there's, uh, there's a clinical situation the person presents with and there's a medication. So obviously some medications work better than others, we're more familiar with some than others um, and, uh, and they, they, they cost differently and, and work, some work more effectively than others. So that's, you know, that's, that's us and the registrar, we're sort of very used to that field so I won't talk any more about it, I think we're, that's where we spend a lot of our time thinking about it. And then finally there are systems and um, and you'd be surprised, unfortunately, how much the uh, systems and marketing things affect what we do. And basically, every, pretty much every high-selling drug over the last, um, you know, sort of 15, 20 years, so most of my career, um, has been affected by marketing um, as much as lots of other things. So um, the. Uh, we've got the, um, yeah, we, we're just talking about quality use of medicines is a critical skill to discuss. Um, the, I'm, I'm sort of not going to draw breath unless uh, someone sort of tells me to stop or, or Glenn interrupts or something. So, um, prescribing patterns. So, where do our registrars learn to prescribe? It's uh, trial and error, it's their knowledge, and it's us. So, I, I do really think it's, it's our role. We talk about drug reps. Um, look, I can say this because none of you can tell me off because you're all on mute. I honestly feel that the responsible position with uh, pharmaceutical marketers is not to see them. That's my belief. Uh, plenty of others disagree, and I, you know, I don't sort of adamantly disagree. I mean, as in, I, I see other people's points, and you can sort out what you want. But I, I do believe uh, personally that that's the ideal. Uh, thing to do, and then there's lots of uh, resources uh, we can use. Um, the, uh, the, the so these are the the people who influence us, the prescribe the supervisor, the pharmacist to some extent, probably an increasing extent actually, for better or worse. I'm not entirely sure, although certainly I think a pharmacist within general practice, um, which only occurs in about 40 places in Australia, I believe, um, or 50. Uh, I think can be a very valuable thing, but it's very hard to get the um, the funding model right on that. Uh, drug reps and patients, patients themselves. This is the sort of headlines. Um, actually, I'm just going to skip over that. This, for anyone who's interested, and I saw, see Gundy M has just put yes exclamation mark. Gundy, I'm taking that as a yes to my brilliant suggestion of not seeing drug reps. Um, not yes when I said I should stop talking. Um, so they free yourself from drug reps. If you want to go to the No Advertising Please website, which is a website I uh, organised uh, about two years ago, and we got lots of publicity at the time. I had about 25 people help me, including Simon Morgan. Um, and uh, and there's sort of on that website we answer all these sorts of questions about uh, drug reps and. Um, because people say, well, how about the sample cupboard and how about this and that? And there's lots of uh, information uh, there. And oh, other people have not seen reps in practice for decades. Good on you guys. Uh, if I could give you the thumbs up, I'd click on it. But a like, you get a like from me. Um, anyway, so that's on that website. The um, there are challenges for registrars, clearly, in prescribing. Uh, it's a very complex decision-making process. And as I say, once you get to polypharmacy, even we are not exactly guessing, but you know, just between us and there's no non-GP supervisors on the phone. I mean, really, it is, it's a tough, it is a tough thing. And you know, quite often, the, person who, the older person who comes in and says, look, I've been feeling a bit giddy in the last month. I mean, boy, oh boy. 
it's not easy. Or, you know, even something more more um, specific, like my legs have been swelling up a bit or something. I mean, often, or, or I'm feeling drowsy, you know, drowsy. I mean, there's a bit tired and confused. I mean, there's so many um, medical processes that can cause that, so many medications can cause that. It's, it's very difficult. Um, so uh, Sue L says, what was that website? You Google, no advertising, please. Um, and uh, you'll find it. Um, the okay, so and then finding a prey for information, and and partly, you know, I mean, these days, really, they do have the information at their fingertips, probably far more than we did when we went through medicine. And uh, there really is no excuse for not having access, you know, to the latest therapeutic um, guidelines, and and obviously, all the practice software has the equivalent of what used to be MIMS, you know, so all the all the information and drug side effects and that sort of thing. Um, so there's that on a purely individual drug by drug level and of course the Australian Medicines Handbook has a bit more useful information as well on, as does therapeutic guidelines on, um, on you know, some more general approaches uh, to medications in particular um, illnesses. And then they need feedback and they need a self-assessment registrars and they need feedback from us. Um, and thank you, Glenn, at a no advertising uh, website on the um, on the text. Um, and uh, so we need to be the ones to give them feedback because again, we are not, I mean, if you're like me, well, probably, no, honestly, nearly all of us, except for real brainiacs, um, you know, we, we tend to settle into our favourite drugs. I don't know the number, I've never counted, but maybe 40 or something like that. You know, the favourite sort of medications and, um, and you know, if a registrar sort of has been prescribing something, their, their I don't know, um, renal physician prescribed a lot or something, we may not have used that particular medication. But, you know, we're smart enough over the years um, to get by and, and know where to look it up and how to look it up and know, have a rough idea of where it fits in the picture, even, though, even if we may not know specifically as much about that particular medication, we might not be able to rattle the doses off or anything. But again, remember, in my book, that's not... We, our, our brilliance at knowing doses and every single drug is not the brilliance the registrars are after. It, it really is, I do believe, that overall um, picture, that, that wisdom we bring and, and um, what would you call it, that, uh, I guess that balance and perspective, I think is the word I'm looking for. All right. Um, this is just looking, we just got uh, about three or four slides just looking at what registrars actually do. So the recent trial I think was done in Newcastle um, and somewhere else, uh, someone on the phone will know, but anyway, Newcastle where Simon is and I helped out a little bit with, uh, and they collected data of what registrars actually do. It's a bit like beach data, in, uh, but for registrars. And they looked, um, so about one per encounter, so not, you know, 95% uh, of encounters, um, that's not 95%, sorry, but if you add up all the medications and add up all the encounters, it, it comes to about a one-to-one -one thing. Of course, you could have more than one medication at an encounter. And these are the new medications. Now, rather than sort of read all these, my observation would be that the new medications which the registrar is initiating, if you have a look down the left-hand column there, I don't think any of them are long term. I'd look, I might have missed one if someone sort of finds out. But but essentially, they're things like you know, prednisolone. You're not usually not long term, and and they're various antibiotics and uh, painkillers. Um, so generally speaking, they're the new medications. Nearly all of them they prescribe are just sort of a short course, and. Continued medication is, of course, you get more of the um, chronic medications. You've got the pill right up there. And th these are in order, by the way, both lists top to bottom from high frequency to lower. Um, and then, you know, oxycodone's in there, which is, uh, despite the fact that it uh, lacks evidence uh, for doing much beyond uh, six to eight weeks in any trial ever done in the world, um, all of us use it uh, in that way, but that's another story. Um, so, yeah, anyway, so they tend to be the chronic things. So the point there is that um, if the most common new medication registrars write is the pill, okay, out of all those um, 
long, uh, all the new medications, that the, the highest up the list for long term is the pill. And that is only uh, 0.4 per 100 encounters. And every other um, new chronic medication comes in at well under 0.4 per 100 encounters. In other words, you know, most new medications, they're prescribing perhaps, you know, once or twice every, you know, 500 patients sort of thing. So really in their entire term, the, the main point here is that if we feel that um, our discussions with the registrars are mainly about the which chronic new medication to start, it's obviously highly important and a skill they need as in general practice, but it is honestly, it's not something they do very often. Far more, they're sort of writing repeat, but nearly all the long-term medications, the registrar is repeating what someone has done before, what we've done uh, usually. Okay, so it's just a concept that uh, we need to be putting an effort into these long-term medications where they're double-clicking on them, okay, because that also is a skill. And also, they do that many, many, many more times than start their own chronic medication. Um, okay, so these are some of the recommendations, and again, coming out of um, some Australian data and some recent, uh, that re R-E-C-E-N-T, that, that study. So um, the recommendations were that uh, clearly as a baseline, all the registrars should have all this stuff up to date. I, I must say, I, I don't think that's a problem. I think uh, in this day and age, they usually, they seem to find uh, websites I never knew existed, and uh, I learned quite a few of my new <laughs> websites from uh, registrars. I learned about, I learned about, oh, I've forgotten the name now, I'm just about to say it. There's a scale which measures anticholinergic uh, side effects, and you bung in, there's websites where you go to it, and you bung in the medication someone's on and the doses, and it will spit out a number. Uh, which is sort of an anticholinergic number, and um, and then you know, and then that shows you how likely they are to be getting sort of anticholinergic side effects, like you know, reduced concentration of falls and constipation, whatever they may be. Um, and and it can be of use if you're thinking of adding in uh, yet another medication which has that sort of side effect. Um, I see Maggie M is pointing out that. Registra female registrars, yes, not phenol. Uh, female registrars um, see younger patients and OCP prescribing pattern. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Um, so yeah, registrars generally, the older you get, the older your patients get. I think there's a general rule. And all those uh, young things, they do prescribe lots of uh, contraception. But that, that's fine. I mean, um, there's, no, you know, there's a bit of a skew one way or the other, but the... Um, we, we have to uh, teach them everything, I guess. Um, so, okay, and then there's, uh, we, we do have to teach them, and the question is, how do we best teach them? So there's, there's various different ways, and as I say, all of us are probably reasonably familiar with running through G classic GP type, you know, disease presentations. So, you know, uh, we, we all would probably have a, little uh, one or two diabetes chutes or hypertension chutes or contraception <coughs> chutes. That's fairly standard for GPT-1 uh, registrars because, you know, they're just things they don't do much of in hospital commencing those sort of things. Um, and then beyond that, uh, I think we need to try to... Um, need to try to teach yeah, some of this other um, bigger picture stuff, that sort of meta stuff. And Simon has written down here, modelling of communication interaction with pharmaceutical representatives. Well, you know my method of communication with pharmaceutical representatives. I won't need to repeat it. Um, there's a good, good point on the comments there by Martina that I think registrars are concerned about stepping on toes if they did prescribe a medication prescribed by their supervisor. I think realistically, that, that's very true. There's no doubt about it. It also, you know, when I argue these things, because whenever I write any articles on these things, I always get a wonderful bunch, none here present, of uh, cranky old uh, GPs who say, how dare I sort of 
tell them what to do from my ivory tower. I think they feel I'm sitting in one. I would like one. Um, but uh, anyway, but one of the things is that, you know, who are we to stop uh, medication started by someone else? Um, and, you know, I mean, my short answer to that is who are we not to, in a way. Um, uh, oh, sorry. TG, sorry, just another question on the side. ETG is the electronic um, therapeutic guidelines, so the electronic version of antibiotic prescribing and, and analgesic prescribing. And AMH is the Australian Medicines Handbook. I think it's put out by the, might be the RSCGP. Anyway, back to the, um, yeah, so I agree that registrars shouldn't be just sort of willy nilly going around ceasing medications which we've, we've just started last week sort of thing, um, unless you know there's a particular reason to or clearly they'd want to talk about it with us and, and sometimes we you know say, oh yes, that, you've got to stop that for sure. So there's nothing to stop them stopping it, but, but it's not, you know, we don't want them sort of going the blitz on us. Um, but I guess, you know, it, it, nonetheless, it remains a skill, I think, to teach them that every time you do, when are these opportunities? I guess they are for the, I need a quick repeat script, or they are when you do a, a health check or an annual review or whatever it is, they, there are certain times we have to teach them the science of going through these things in some detail. Um, and the, um, there's various things like NPS programs and various other things to talk about the quality use of medicine. Um, and then for advanced registrars um, who are sort of heading towards their second term and third term, we can there's prescribing audits they can do as well, uh, which I think can be very useful. I um, personally find that the most useful uh, method is to occasionally do a um, a review, a, a random case analysis. I think um, it's called, which is where you have a tube where you just say, okay. Show me the patients from your morning session yesterday and let's have a look at the prescription list of the things you prescribed and also the current medication list of those, um, you know, 10 patients you saw yesterday morning. That might be, um, might be quite optimistic, the four patients you saw yesterday morning or whatever it is, um, and let's go through them. And there's some patients there'll be very little to say, and some will be on no medication, but you know, I think it's, there'll be some where it certainly brings up a lot of um, possible things to talk about just based on a patient they know, and preferably a patient they know and you know, and you can discuss those things. Um, quality use of medicines is as defined on this. Uh, page and clearly very key to what we do. Um, I think Martina, who's typing away judiciously and uh, very enthusiastically there, good on you Martina, with very few spelling mistakes. I can say that as a writer too, that's, that's impressive. Um, so uh, is talking about other ways of um, teaching with a registrar, some joint case reviews, which is pretty much I guess what we're, um, what we're talking about. Um, I'm going to do that. That's a pretty colour diagram, which I'm skipping over because, let's face it, I don't like those things. Too many words. All right. Um, this is the, you could say, the bit we've all been waiting for. This is the crux of the matter, is uh, ways we can assess and teach. And we've started talking about that already. Um, these are lots of questions here, which would Again, not very suitable for a webinar, but the things we can um, talk about. The other thing, that middle dot point there about assessing our registrar's competence to rational uh, in relation to rational prescribing. I think again, that is really well done with this random case analysis. So you, um, you know, maybe if you skip a, um, the tute I was talking about was more sort of including just patients who are on lots of medications, whether or not the registrars put them on them. And as we've just discovered, they don't usually, they're not usually the one who has put them on them. And just flicking through, say, an entire day's um, patients, but only looking at what medication did you start and at what dose and why. And I think, um, you know, if you get through I don't know, 10 of them and and you'd agree with most of the prescribing decisions. I think that is a good little mini audit for you to get your head around, okay, that 
the registrar sort of knows what they're talking about. Well, often we tend to sit in with the G, GPT ones a fair bit early on in their time, and then after, and and we sort of, you know, they may only make a couple of prescribing decisions while we're sitting in with them, and then after that, they tend to call us in for stuff. Um, and we, we some of the some of the stuff they're not calling us in for might slip us by, and I think it, it is good to be able to do that um, duck in and, and look at a whole day's patients at some stage, just a snippet out of each um, each day. Uh, what have we got here? More things we have. Uh, do an RCA session, okay? Random case analysis. Oh yes. Oh good. Didn't know they had an acronym. Uh, ask them to do an RCA on a session of the supervisor's patients. Oh, very good, Maggie. You're very brave. They can take their smartphones in and be smarter than us and uh, tell us what we did wrong. Now that's that's a very good thing, and we can. Um, it's actually it's actually very reassuring, uh, honestly, if you. A, a, are uh, brave enough yourself, and I think we all should be. It's actually very reassuring if your uh, registrar comes up and says, "Look, you know, let's look at these things." Ooh, I wouldn't usually do that because I've heard that it can interact with this, and you know, it's the sort of page where I've skipped over when it shows fifty interactions, and I just click and I don't worry about it, which most of us do automatically. Um, yeah, and maybe sometimes it does matter, and it's quite—I um, wouldn't say humbling, but it's quite a good learning experience for us for them to uh, look at us. What resources are available? Um, while you're looking at that slide, we have Charles saying, I explained to Registrar that a prescription should be a, a court case to justify it. Uh, it must be a good build case to let patient going away with a signed script. Charles, I'm not as impressed with your um, typing as I was the uh, previous person, but I think I get what you mean. You um, should be able to mount a defence uh, as to why you're prescribing something, or, or perhaps not prescribing something. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's perhaps another model, uh, looking at the pros and cons, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, um, you know, have your for and against case. And again, that's something which maybe we go through in our head very, very quickly, because um, if we went through it very slowly, we'd never see enough patients. But, um, you know, but we're making explicit our thought processes for the registrar. Um, the uh, Glenn, could I just ask you, uh, we, would you like me to finish on the dot in three minutes time, if you're still listening and not asleep? I'm totally listening and what I'm going to say is because we did start uh, late, uh, apologies to those that do need to leave, appreciate that, that some may need to, but if you'd like to continue that would be fantastic. Okay, I will plan on finishing in less than another 10 minutes, but honestly, if anyone wants to drop out and uh, feed the kids or the chooks, that's absolutely understandable. All right. Um, so, oh, keep going, please. Oh, my goodness. All the ones I praised for their good uh, writing skills are saying, uh, asking me to keep going. I know Charles V hasn't asked me, but that's fine. Um, so we have, yeah, so the, looking at the principles to guide our training. So um, the, yeah, so we do need this protected time. So uh, protected time is very hard with registrars, and we, I must say myself, life is busy, your morning's busy, and you love those sort of um, quick interactions with a registrar, and they certainly get easier and easier as they get on and on in their terms, where you just come in for the most interesting, you know, two minutes of the conversation, consultation, and sort of bang, 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 here you go, and away you go. Um, but we do, of course, need that uh, protected time. In fact, we sign up for it, don't we? Um, where we don't just do the in and out thing, where we do do some of these more formal ways of measuring things. And certainly some of the stuff we've talked about today, you really can't do without sort of setting aside, you know, at least probably more than half an hour, ideally an hour, but maybe you know, three quarters of an hour or something to go through these things. And it can be fun too because it's not, it's not something you have to prepare. That's the other thing. If it's good for lazy GP supervisors. They're out of the 45 of us, I'm sure there's only about three of those on the line. But, uh, um, but yeah, so you don't have to prepare these things. You just have to have the concepts in mind. Okay, this is what we're going to do. Walk in, open their patients, and away you go, which is great. 
Um, the uh, supervision, that middle point is really what we do anyway, I think. And then the important thing of the last dot point there is a blame-free learning environment. And no, no such thing as a lazy GP supervisor. That would be your CEO talking. Yes, Glenn, that's right. There's not. Um, anyway, so the blame-free learning environment, the, the, and again, that suggestion of the registrar auditing our stuff, well, not exactly auditing, but, you know, going over our prescriptions, that, you know, th there's nothing like a bit of humility. And, I mean, really, the, one of the honest beauties of being a GP is that you're, there's that whole concept of, you know, incompetence, and you try to make sure that it's conscious incompetence. There's that concept of knowing a bit about everything and it's very hard to become an expert in more than a handful of special interests. And that concept of um, uncertainty and the concept of you don't have to nail everything before the patient leaves the room because if you tried to, you'd you know, be in there for an hour and also you'd be ordering things left, right and centre which they probably didn't need if you just let, let it go for four days and got them to come back. So, so that those whole things are a bit of, um, you know, it's a bit humbling as a GP but on the other hand I do think it's one of our strengths and what we're good at. And, you know, particularly compared to the hospital environment, I think we are, most of us, also very good at being blame-free. I mean, I'm not talking here about a, a difficult registrar or an incompetent one who's really messing up. That's a different thing altogether. But for your average registrar, they're going to make mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. We'll hopefully make fewer mistakes and be more confident about when we don't know, and that's our role. And that's what we have to teach the, uh, the registrars. So I think that's sort of uh, positive, gentle feedback. And, you know, if they mess up a bit or whatever, it's, it's nice that they get that feedback. And picking a, a bit of a mess up on, uh, a minor mess up on, on one patient, you know, will have its flow on effects to, you know, 100 patients they see throughout their, their career or over the next couple of years. Um, the... That's a bit boring. That's a bit boring. I'm going off that one too. Let's go to strategy. You know, the boring ones are all the ones Simon put up there, of course. He's not here to answer. The strategies for teaching. Um, so, again, we've covered a lot of these. So, direct observation, that's you observing them. That's a, a in-depth strategy, I guess, but it's not, you don't get through many cases. Um, certainly more early on in their career early on in their term is very important for lots of reasons besides prescribing obviously. A problem case discussion, so that's where you, and now you can pick up these, so NPS Medicine Wise on their website, if you click on the bits that say um, for practitioners or general practitioners, um, then they actually have case discussions. Now if you guys have had their um, people come around and see you and talk about you know back pain or or this or that, opioids or diabetes or whatever, um, often they'll, the person will bring a few case discussions. But they're all freely available on the website and what's more, you can cheat, you have the answers. And in fact, um, Glenn was talking, I went to this great talk uh, by Glenn on the weekend and uh, talking about this new resource you're getting up on GPSA. Would that, would that help for some of this stuff, uh, Glenn, do you think? Sorry, what was that, the teaching uh, plan? So there, there's stuff we're doing in that workshop. Would there be, this, um, some of that would also be useful for, which you're developing a series of uh, sort of topic-based approaches to um, learning, re with resources for learning more about, uh, some, some of them would, would be involved prescribing decisions, I guess, and resources. Absolutely. So there's three there's three teaching plans that have been put into the document box down the bottom right um, yep. that you can download straight away. But equally, I'm sending those out and link uh, to everybody's email address momentarily. Great. Um, and we'll be developing more of those on in uh, on a variety of topics. So have a look at the website and um, yeah.
Thank you. Lovely. Okay, thank you. I like how you just did that little flashing thing on that. There's a little folder icon on the bottom right of this. Uh, random case analysis of mention, RCA, or well, it does pop up. Um, topic tutorial scenario based. So these are, you know, we have a person come in with a particular thing, uh, a, a, a role play person or a, or a paper based person, not a real person. Um, and then you've got the guidelines and prescribing audits. I mean, probably they're a bit complex to be fair, but certainly uh, they're good for the more advanced registrar perhaps to do one. Uh, Challenge colleagues, because I don't even know what that means. I'm going to skip over that as well. Um, look, we are, we are. I am going to sort of wind this up uh, within a couple of minutes. Um, I wanted to just, um, oh yeah, oh I'm skipping. Just skip to this uh, choosing wisely thing, another good resource. I mean, it's, these are all my biased resources because I'm the chair of the GP choosing wisely. Um, Thing. So I'm the one who ends up writing, wording all those uh, five recommendations and now there's ten. Um, but some of these uh, recommendations are related to prescribing. So for example, uh, proton pump inhibitors long term. So you know when I get med students to bring in examples of um, people on lots of medications and we talk about them, they do a little audit as part of the Griffith Uni course I teach, uh, the general practice component of the course. and. The, honestly, I reckon about one in ten people who are on polypharmacy aren't on a proton pump inhibitor. In other words, about nine in ten are. Um, you know, but they're designed. They're, we should perhaps be thinking of that more as inflammation, a bit like dermatitis is inflammation, so gastritis. You know, with various exceptions for bleeding and Barrett's esophagus, but not many exceptions. You can safely have a trial of. Um, of coming off those things, so that you know, uh, and then there's another one on. Oh, that's right. The I was just going to get back to the kid at the start, the three-year-old kid with the sore ear. Again, I'm skipping over this. Um, you know, the kid with the sore ear. One of the other choosing wiser recommendations is actually that they do not need an antibiotic. So I think it reads. Between the ages of two and twelve, with the exception of Aboriginal kids, but for non-Aboriginal kids, um, for uh, otitis media, antibiotics um, aren't particularly recommended. So they don't relieve pain uh, or do anything, make any difference in the first 24 hours. They make a very slight difference between, I think, two and six days, and then uh, they make no difference to resolution after the seventh day and beyond. Um, and that's as long as you have the capacity to get them back um, and you're in a position that you can see them again if things get worse. There might be, there are always exceptions to these things. They're not hard and fast rules, you know, someone sort of, Going out bush or something, um, then you might you might want to do it. But but in general, and this is a list of some other independent information. And actually, the very very final thing I'm going to do is 808, and I have two minutes. Is just give a plug actually, but it's not. It's sort of a conflict of interest again, but it's not anything uh, that I'll get anything from. So, but I have just for those who are interested, I've started a uh, GP podcast called GP Skeptics. And um, I've uh, just put out my first three, just because it's sort of about looking at uh, research that affects general practitioners and trying to look at it in a light-hearted way and trying to be a bit funny, which is, uh, I'm not very funny, but Liz um, Sturgis, who I do it with, she's quite funny. And, uh, and so it's some easy listening as you ride to work and get your, um, your daily exercise or whatever you do. You can have a listen to those, and I think there's some sort of link somewhere or other um, to those as well. You could always find them on uh, iTunes by typing in GP Skeptics with a C. Oh, there's another little arrow popping up there. Look at that on the folder. I think that means that Glenn's put the, put the link there. Or yeah. Anyway, just for those of you who are interested, you can become our um, sixth and seventh listeners. Uh, it's only just come out and let's face it, it's an incredibly niche audience. <laughs> academic -y, teachy, gp -y people. Uh, I think with that, I think I will stop talking. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Justin. It's been fantastic to have you here, and uh, you did step in at the very last minute, so 
thank you for saving our bacon. We hope that you've enjoyed tonight's uh, session. Uh, if you've enjoyed this webinar, look out for our future session. The next one will be Feedback, Balance Between Unicorns and Brutality. Uh, and that will be presented by Conrad Kangaroo, who presented the Identifying and Supporting Registrars at Risk webinar earlier in, in the year, which was very well received. So uh, another fantastic one It will be our last webinar for the year. That's on 30th of October, 8 to 9 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Uh, as always, we thank and recognise the Australian Government uh, for uh, our funders. Uh, we're funded under the Australian General Practice Training Program and without their support we certainly couldn't bring these and many other resources to you. So thanks very much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at some future webinars. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.